Comic Boom here to report to you directly to the Batcave. Although most of you aren't in the Batcave, but I have a nice little scene set up here with members in the Batcave. Batman, James Tenney the Fourth is really hitting it, the, hitting it out of the park with Batman, isn't he? But in any event, guys, I have teamed up with Jace of Comic Source. We're reviewing DC comic books on a weekly basis, and this week we're reviewing the comic books for March 9th, 2021, and we'll get to that right away. We're going to be reviewing Wonder Woman issue 770, Batman Urban Legends number 1, uh, Grant Morrison's season 2 Green Lantern number 12, the final issue of that series, Rorschach number 6, Superman number 29, and Joker number 1. And just a heads up, I'll be reviewing Earth 1 volume 3 of Grant Morrison's Wonder Woman in a subsequent, in another video. But guys, please hit the subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter at Metropolis40. Also follow... Jace uh, on his podcast Comic Source. You can watch this, you can listen to this as a podcast at Comic Source and I'm going to leave the link below or you can also, you can just use the timestamps that I'll also have below with this video so you can jump ahead to the comic book of your choice that you want to hear the review for because this is an over two hour long uh, YouTube video and it's probably easier just to have the timestamps time stamps there so you can just jump ahead to the comic book you want to hear Jason and I talk about. Okay, guys, so without further ado, let's get to it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Comic Source slash Comic Boom DC Friday Spotlight. This is for the books that were released on March 9th, 2021. So Rocky from Comic Boom and I are going to talk about the books in detail. Be warned, there are spoilers. If you haven't had a chance to read the books that came out four days ago, you may want to pause the podcast or pause the YouTube video and come back when you've had a chance to uh, give them a read. Uh, we're going to be talking about the books from the ninth, as I said. So Superman number 29, Joker number one, which came as a big surprise to me, Rocky. I don't know how you felt about it, uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get into yeah, that. We'll get into that, yeah. Yeah, Wonder Woman number 770, uh, a surprise in a different way. Uh, Green Lantern season two, number 12, which finishes up that Grant Morrison, Liam Sharp run. Rorschach number six, halfway through with the Tom King and Jorge Fornes uh, limited maxi series, I suppose you'd say. And then the first issue of the new Batman anthology, Batman Urban Legends. So uh, we're going to kick it off with uh, Superman number 29. So let me just real briefly give the, the creative team and then we'll kind of give our thoughts. Uh, it's the Golden Age Part 1, Philip Kennedy Johnson writing, Phil Hester handling the pencils, Eric Gabster on inks, Hi-Fi does the colors, and Dave Sharp on letters. Uh, and I think I'll let you go first, Rocky, despite the fact that Superman is my favorite character, because I, I have a feeling you don't <laughs> have that much to say uh, about this issue. So, uh, well, I of, of all the... I'll be honest, of all the comic books uh, that we're going to be reviewing today, this one was my was the one that I was least interested in and I think is the least uh, interesting and the least exciting. And it's it's not even that it's that bad. I'm uh, uh, straight up just to give you a, a cold zones version of my mood today. I'm very happy. I'm, I'm like I like I like what I'm seeing from D.C. I like this direction. I feel much better than I did pre pre death metal. I got to tell you. Overall, I think I think we're we got some good reasons to hope that we're going to be getting some good stories moving forward. This golden age story with Superman and, and, and John Kent, it's sort of we've sort of seen this before. Philip uh, Kennedy Johnson sort of played his hand with Future State and, uh, you know, and, and so did the other writer, uh, Sean, I think Sean Lewis, in, yep. in regard to what, what they're going to be doing with uh, Superman moving forward, generally speaking. And it's just it. It, it deals with, you know, again, John Kent. I'm not even sure why they're calling this the golden age. I, I will give, uh, I'm going to start with the, the high points of this. I, I think I'm going to, I'll, I'll give uh, PKJ uh, some credit here. I thought there was some decent character work of John Kent that, you know, in terms of how he feels about his dad, uh, we, there, there were earlier hints that we're, we might get some actual ramifications from what happened from, from that time that John Ken spent, you know, all that time dealing with a psychotic grandfather and ultimately being aged up so quickly. We, we get sort of hints of that here uh, in terms of the, 
there's a focus on the relationship between John Kent and his father. And, and he, there's some moments here. They're all too brief in my mind, but at least we get some moments where Superman acknowledges that he sort of misses his son. He, he talks about, you know, it, all of a sudden, I mean, it, it must be pretty traumatic that, that, that what they went through, I mean, all of a sudden your, your 10 year old son, 17 years old, or, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's older. And then it seems like just a, a year ago, you were playing with your 10 year old son and now you want to do the same thing, but your son's 17 years old. And there's those moments between Superman and John Kent where it becomes apparent that, that obviously uh, Kalal, you know, loves his son, but there's that he's older now. And there's, there is, there's gotta be some disconnect there. I wish PKJ was do it, did a slightly better job at conveying how di how jarring that must be. Now let's be blunt here. Bendis did no job of it. Bendis did a horrendous job. Bendis completely ignored it as if it wasn't a big deal. To PKJ's credit, he's at least trying a little bit, but I think more needs to be done. And I hate putting that burden on PKJ, but that's the, that's in the job description, my friend. <laughs> if you want to leave, uh, if you want to leave John Kent aged up seven years, you got to deal with the ramifications of that. And one good thing that's come out of this, at least in terms of the character work, is that it looks as if John Kent, you know, he's because he was he's been to the future and he and they're really doubling down on John Kent having his formative years in the future. He knows or at least he believes the that he's aware of at least some of the events that, that are going to lead to his father's death. And so I think emotionally, I think there was there's I think I think PKJ did a, at least a a reasonably decent job of, of saying, of showing that this is a big deal for John Kent and he doesn't want to lose his dad and, and the threat that they're going to be facing. And I found it interesting that Amanda Waller comes in and plays a role. Now we know that Amanda Waller ultimately ends up taking Connor Kent, kidnapping Connor Kent <laughs> into earth three to be the Superman of earth three. Why does Amanda Waller of all characters show up in the pages here of Superman number 29? I thought that was really interesting. And because they, they rec she recognizes that there's this shift, that something is occurring and, and, and this threat is coming in from another universe that will ultimately take down Superman and, uh, and of course, potentially lead to his death. And, and John Kent knows this and he gets quite emotional about it because he doesn't want to lose his father. And... Uh, and that's basically how it, the, the, the sort of the issue that the story basically ends that way, sort of alluding to a, a greater threat that is that Superman is going to face. And we, we have to remember, uh, Jace, and we should remember everyone listening should remember this who's reading DC Comics. Don't be necessarily don't drink the complete Kool-Aid of future state. The future is not yet written in stone. It is a future that can indeed be avoided. This is a, so don't, we cannot assume that just the outcomes that we read in future state are necessarily going to be the outcomes moving forward. It's, it's, the future is not yet written in stone. And that's going to be particularly driven home uh, when we get into justice, when we start talking about some of the uh, 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 events in, in the other books. Uh, but in any event, I, I thought this was, I'm just not interested in the story, but I thought it was at least reasonably, it, it was decent. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad story. And artistically, I'm not a fan of the art. I'm not really not a fan of the art. Uh, straight up, Phil Hester, I think, is the wrong person for this. Uh, but he, he, he hits, I mean, the, the coloring is great. And I, I always understood what was going on. There was decent enough action. I just, his particular style for me, wasn't really my cup of tea. And, uh, and I have, I have some things to comment on the backup, but I'll let you comment about Superman, about the story, what you thought of it. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't really care for it either. Um, to talk about the art for, first of all, you're right. Hi-fi color. It, it's pitch perfect. It, it's nice primary colors which uh, I always prefer on a Superman book rather than making it uh, pastel looking or uh, like the coloring on action comics when Bendis was trying to turn action comics into Superman crime noir. And it was colored appropriately for crime noir, but it's not a, a color palette that suits Superman. Superman should, the color should be very primary and bright. So it feels like a superhero book and Hi-Fi uh, handles that expertly. Um, but I agree with you about the line work. Uh, the, the compositions themselves the, the, and the transitions from panel to panel in terms of storytelling are all done really well. 
from from Hester uh, as well as the the camera angles. But but his aesthetic, his style, um, which is it, it's not very fluid uh, to me, just doesn't suit superhero books for me. You know, speaking of crime noir, that's where Phil Hester shines or slice of life kind of stuff, um, stuff that's a little more quirky storytelling, because uh, I, I just don't feel that his his style is suited for superhero books. And it's nothing against uh, Phil at all. He's a great guy. But uh, I just don't feel that his aesthetic is is right. And I've heard people, oh, his stuff looks very classic or golden age. Uh, no, it, it doesn't at all to me um, because he, his stuff is more detailed than that. Um, and you just look at Superman where his, his muscles are very squared off. Um, and that works in the face with the square jaw, but it doesn't work so much in terms of trying to convey movement and such. So, um, you know, it's not bad art in terms of, of storytelling and technically it's not bad. There's, I have no problems with anatomy or anything like that, but just aesthetically, it's, it's not the, the right, the right choice. Uh, in terms of pacing, that's where this really starts to fall down for me. Superman himself. So the, the first part of the book is narrated by John Kent. That's where we get the, the golden age reference uh, of the title of the story. John's talking about how there's a golden age when you're a kid where you think your parents can do no wrong. You think your parents are superheroes. In his case, it's literally true. His dad is Superman. Uh, but that just means he's got that much farther to fall when you start seeing the, the cracks, right? Um, and Rocky alluded to it about how John spent so much time in the future with the Legion of Superheroes. He knows the downfall. He knows the mistakes his father's going to make. It takes the shine off of it, which I guess Philip Kennedy Johnson is trying to explain to us why there starts to be that disconnect where John starts to have, I don't know, like PTSD or mental problems or, or whatever. I mean, we, we are being hit over the head with the failures of John Kent ever since Future State started, really ever since uh, Bendis aged him up, which I think is is a problem. And I think is why a lot of fans didn't respond to it. It's bad enough you took a beloved character at a state that, that people loved him, and then you you age him up and fans feel like they were robbed of, you know, X amount of years of storytelling from this character. But then you you introduce trauma because of that. And, and it makes sense. Like, uh, like Rocky was saying, and we, we both give credit to Philip Kennedy Johnson for addressing it. But the problem is that nobody wants to read that. This is a character that we love, that was happy, that was go lucky, that was positive. And now we're hearing about him making mistake after mistake after mistake. And why is it happening? Oh, because the guy's never had a break. He was born in one reality uh, or conceived in one reality, born in another reality, grows up on a third world in hiding, and then gets kidnapped by a psychotic grandfather. Uh, trapped by a doppelganger, his father in a volcano and tortured for years. Yeah, anybody would be screwed up. Um, we're not dismissing that. We're not saying that he shouldn't be screwed up. We're just saying we, we wish it hadn't happened because this is a character that we liked. And now all of a sudden it, we're being bombarded with it, right? We saw the mistakes he made in Future State Superman of Metropolis. We saw the mistakes that, um, or the, the potential for uh, him becoming a tyrant in the pages of Infinite Frontier Zero. And now here we're hearing from John himself about how, you know, he sees his father as something less. The seeds are being planted for him to become this tyrant. We can all see the writing on the wall and we, it's like, stop the, the, the ride. I want to get off. This is not something I care to read. Um, but back to what I was first going to say uh, with the whole, that's all we're getting in the first half of the issue with John narrating. We don't get Superman. This, this, this is Superman number 29. It's a Superman comic. Superman himself doesn't speak until page 14 page 14 that <laughs> is a problem that's a problem and i get that you're trying to establish mood and john kent and blah 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 but it's a problem why am i hearing from amanda waller of all people who i cannot stand why am i hearing <laughs> her talk and have agency in a superman book before superman himself that is a complete failure to me of, of a narrative timeline. It, you're not going to hook anybody. Anybody I feel like who's a Superman fan is going to read this and go, this isn't a Superman book. When Superman himself doesn't talk until page 14. And then when he does, it's very awkward conversation between him and John. And I don't know if Philip Kenny Johnson was doing that on purpose because he was saying they've been separated for so long and it's no longer comfortable i just have a hard time as a parent like if i i raised somebody as a child for 9 10 11 years whatever however old john was and then went away and he was gone for x number of years 
and he comes back, I feel like we, yeah, there would be some awkwardness, but in very quick order, that would all like go away. Right. And I think we saw that when he did come back in the pages of Superman, when Bendis was handling it as clunky as Bendis's dialogue could, could be at times. Now it's like, we've taken a step backwards and it's like he, John just got back and they don't know how to talk to each other. And so I, I thought that was a problem. It just could not coming across as authentic. And all, yeah. all this book felt like to me was just laying the groundwork for emotional drama and emotional trauma and a way to, to break down John and, and put John through the ringer again. And so, I, again, I'm not on board with that. I've had enough of beating up on John Kent. Um, so no, I didn't, I didn't like this issue. And to your point, Rocky, about Amanda Waller showing up, are you effing kidding me, man? Like she, <laughs> she's a garbage character. We've talked about it ad nauseum at this point about why she doesn't work as a character, uh, how she doesn't have enough depth, how she's a, a complete trope, um, a complete stereotype, angry, you know, black woman, whatever. She needs to be updated. She needs to be brought in the modern world. She needs to be fleshed out to, to become a good character. There is some potential there. Um, very little at this point in my mind. I, I kind of almost think she's ruined beyond belief and you just put her away and come up with a new character. But that's, you know, <laughs> that's that's maybe sour grapes in my opinion because um, I just, I've never liked her as a character and she's only gotten worse over time. And, and I, I just, I frankly have had enough of her. I'm sick of her. Uh, we got her in the pages of Suicide Squad. Okay, that makes sense. But uh, I got to read about her in Superman also. No, uh, no, I don't, I, that's no, just, I mean, we, bad enough. We had her in action comics with Leviathan for pages upon yeah. pages and issues upon issues. Just no, I want to read a Superman book because I like Superman. He's the symbol of hope. It should be an uplifting book. Yes, there needs to be drama. Yes, he needs to be challenged. I get that. But man, no, no, no easier way to, to turn a book uh, negative than to throw Amanda Waller and her garbage in there. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't like this at all. Not one bit. Um, and I, it, it, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm based just on this one issue. I rather would have had Ben to stay on the book. Well, well, you know what? I, and that's the, that's one of the issue and the problems. And, and this is why I have uh, PKJ has my sympathies having uh, taking the chores on this because, you know, Bendis wrote aged up John Kent in a horrendous manner and then ignored the consequences of the aging up and still wrote John Kent as if he was a 10 year old trapped in a 17 year old mind, which yep. in a sense, maybe he was, but he really wasn't because he was psychologically tormented for seven years in a torment in a, in a volcano by Ultraman on, on, on a crazy earth three, um, and then despite being able, having the prime opportunity to undo all that crap with death metal, because they, they could have went, they could have simply undone it. They brought Roy Harper back from the dead. They can yep. do everything. This is a brand new, they could have undone all of it, but no, of all the things they leave in place, they leave the one thing in place and not, not a single fan wants. And, and so now PKJ has to deal with it. And again, it's hard for me. I mean, I know I, we can say to PKJ, well, you know, you're a writer, suck it up and deal with it. I do, I do have some sympathy for him because now he, he's, he's actually dealing with a consequence of it. He's not ignoring the fact that there must be a psychological impact on John Kent. At least he's making John Kent show some emotion. He's not ignoring it and not, like Bendis did. Bendis, uh, shame on Bendis, did a terrible job, didn't address any of it. Now PKJ is trying to at least address some of it. And so I am going to give this, uh, you know, I'm going to cut this some slack, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to enjoy the journey. <laughs> and that's as simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I agree with you. Um, I, I, it's just, it, it's disappointing, you know, after dealing with some subpar, what I consider subpar Superman stories for a lot of years, uh, I, I was just, you know, so excited when somebody else was coming on. Um, and now it's like, really, this is what I waited for. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, just God, DC, just put Mark Wade on the book already, you know, like Please, just, yes. just God, <laughs> just stop already with this nonsense and just give Wade a shot. So anyway, uh, I'll talk real briefly about, about the backup tales of Metropolis Bibbo, Sean Lewis writing Sam Basri, Sammy Basri rather on colors you uh, or, or is the artist Sammy Basri artist uh, Ulysses Areola colors, Dave Sharp letters. Uh, I thought this was interesting. Bibbo writing an article for the, the Daily Planet, and we were introduced to a couple of new villains. Uh, Jimmy's playing his you know newfound role as 
uh, you know, richest guy in town and, and, and all that things, so, uh, all that stuff. So I, I thought this was enjoyable. Uh, I, I it, it felt a little more hearkening back to the classic triangle era of, uh, of Superman with all these supporting characters. So uh, I, I vastly preferred the backup story. I thought it was better in quality. I thought it was better in terms of artwork. Uh, it just worked for me a lot better. It felt a lot more like a Superman story in tone, even though Superman's not even in it than, uh, than the main story. So uh, I did like it, but this wouldn't be enough. The backup story wouldn't be enough for me to, to pick up the book going forward. Um, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but there, there may be a world in which I don't, I don't buy the Superman books which is which is crazy i mean i i mean i probably still have to buy action because you know i have not all of the issues but you know i'm trying to keep my my run going um and it's up past a thousand now and i i just have to I, that's that's the collector part of me but i don't know maybe i just buy it and just stick it in my box without reading it so what do you think about the backup rock yeah uh i i thought i like you, I thought it was well written. I thought Sean Lewis did a good job. I, I I thought it was actually it was actually kind of a refreshing take on Bibbo. Bibbo has always been sort of betrayed, like sort of like the big dumb strong guy. At least they're giving him, uh, they're imbuing him with a little bit of intelligence. He actually has a talent as a writer. That was actually nice to see. So I think that's sort of going against the type, and and that's actually nice to see. And 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 I'm I'm a little. I'm curious about these new villains. They, they seem to have an agenda of maybe toppling the Daily Planet by sort of starting at the foundations, as they say, to try to, de go, you know, maybe try to had an, ha trying to take down the Daily Planet by through one of their writers, one of their more insignificant writers, namely Bibbo himself, which again is a little, you know, so it's a simultaneous insult to, to Bibbo, yet a compliment because he's, he's sort of the target. And Jimmy Olsen, I actually, I, I, I like the way Jimmy Olsen is written here, not not in in the the insulting way he was written in in Future State, where he, he looks like a dilapidated old street <laughs> urchin bum. Like it was, I don't know, but in any event, I enjoyed this. It was it was a decent read, but at the same time, I got to be straight up and honest. I just don't care about Bibbo and Jimmy Olsen. I, I, it's not not enough for me to. I I would rather pay less for the comic book than read this story, <laughs> just because I'm not interested in the characters. Straight up. Yep. I, yeah, hey, I agree. Yeah, 100, I agree. hundred percent. I agree. 100%. Like in the triangle era, they were able to have supporting characters and the books weren't extra length and didn't cost more money. And they felt like Superman books. Um, the only thing about this backup is yes, I did get a sense of a Superman story, but you're right for the added cost. I'd rather not have it there, but then there's literally no reason to read it at all. Um, not that I think the Bibbo stories is, is worth the money and, and worth picking up the book but anyway let's yeah. move on um yeah. i am i am woefully behind uh i'm ashamed to say on green lantern the green lantern uh but uh the the finale is out this week and came out on tuesday so we definitely wanted to acknowledge that and rocky is caught up so uh we're going to give him a chance to talk about it it is written by grant morrison art and colors by liam sharp letters by steve wands so give us your thoughts rocky how do you think this series uh wrapped up uh, well, I have to say that, uh, I was, uh, a little bit of quick history on my, my, uh, my opinions on Grant Morrison. I remember reading final crisis and being completely lost by it and, and simultaneously totally impressed with it. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those, I am one of those Grant Morrison apologists one minute and then I'll flip flop and, and, and get angry with him the next. So I don't know where I stand with Morrison. You know, my opinion on him changes like the wind, which generally is a sign to me of a really good writer. <laughs> he's always, he always, he's so creative, so thought provoking in terms of what he writes. I, I reread issues uh, six uh, through 12 here of uh, season two of the Green Lantern. There is so much brilliance and so much fun. The reverence that he gives to Green Hell Jordan is so awesome. He's so cool, as written by Grant Morrison. The concepts in here are just incredible. I mean, we've had a wedding of uh, we had a wedding of the Trillennium in issue nine. We had the multi crisis of intimate Earths uh, on in issue ten, dealing with uh, Earth eleven and uh, the Carol Ferris of Earth 11. And, and, and this ultimately, one could even argue that this is leading in, this is a glorified love story for Hal Jordan between him and Carol Ferris. And, and it also in, involves this ultra war. 
which is in which also involves the dark universe and this war of everything that ultimately leads in issue 12 to this ultra war which has been alluded to even back in season one of green lantern 24 issues of jam-packed creative imagination craziness and my liam sharp this is such a beautiful beautiful comic book if i had one wish for everybody i wish everybody could have a nice big computer screen i mean look i i i you know i'll i'll, I'll be getting the i got the comics as well and they're beautiful in comic book form but man on a, on a nice big screen <laughs> computer monitor liam sharp sharp's art just absolutely it's so so beautiful one thing that grant morrison because of liam sharp's artistic talent is able to pull off better than has ever been done in the better than any green lantern comic i have ever read hands down better than anything that's come out from jeff johns yes i'm saying it this is better than all of that artistically and visually you get the best sense of just how wondrous the universe is because of liam sharp and grant morrison's imagination just everything from the Green Lantern ring have, being its own AI, having its own sentience now, being able to decide for itself what to do, uh, to to incredible different life forms that uh, everything from from surgical nanites that heal people possessing rings to crazy looking other aliens that possess rings, to uh, through multi through Grant Morrison exploring his own multiverse that he created in multiversity. And and different Green Lanterns and and Hyperman and Superwoman and uh, Strength Woman and all these crazy characters from the multiverse that he essentially brought in in Final, uh, you know, in Multiversity. Now, how did do, how does all this end? This wraps up with a nice little bow on it. I'm not going to sit here. I don't have enough time to explain it all because I I only read I read I read the final issue once. I but I read issues six through 10, uh, six through 11 multiple times. I love it. I'm reading issue 12 when we're done this broadcast. This is this is absolutely fantastic. War with the anti-world, Sinestro, the weapon ear, the re reversal, the reversal verse, the ultra war, dark universe, war of everything. This is Hal Jordan fighting every single enemy in his rogues gallery that he has ever had, heralded by Hector Hammond, who now possesses uh, his ring. How does Hal Jordan, at the end of issue 11, all was lost, all was lost. And, and only Hal Jordan could, could, to, could fight this battle. And he has to do it alone. He can't have anybody else help him. And you got to read this story to understand why it's too complicated to explain. And I'm not even sure I, I, I could do it justice. But it, look, if you're not a fan of Morrison, you're not, you're not reading this anyway. But my God, man, if you have the time and you have like me and you sat down with a nice crown with a nice, you know, big ice cube in a, in a glass and sipping it and, and sitting back and enjoying this. I thoroughly enjoyed this. This, this is one of my favorite books of the week. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm woefully behind. I'm still back in season one and I'm not a Morrison fan and I will say on subsequent re readings, it does get, get better. So it may be one of those things where reading it in big chunks helps. Um, I do plan on reading it. I, I bought all the issues cause I wanted the art. I, I bought it for the art cause Liam, um, and the art got uh, got progressively better throughout the the series. So I'm looking forward to sitting down at some point and, and reading it all together. Um, and especially because it sounds like we're not going to be getting any Hal Jordan love anytime soon. And uh, Morrison gave us a lot of Hal Hal Jordan love. So I wonder what Jeffrey Thorne might think of this series, being that he said Hal Jordan is the worst comic character ever created. Uh, <laughs> and and, and, and any, anyway, moving on. Uh, to a book I did read, uh, Rorschach number six, written by Tom King, Jorge Fornes on uh, the interiors and the cover art, Dave Stewart colors, Clayton Cowell letters. Uh, this is a little bit of a down issue for Rorschach in my mind. So uh, what are your thoughts on it, Rocky? Uh, what I love about Rorschach, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I haven't done in well over, I think it's two years I'm going to sing Tom King's praises. I really, really love this. I, 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 and again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I know I'm supposed to try to be constructively critical here, but I got to tell you, man, I'm just overall impressed this this week by through, through most of it. I love how he's approaching this, that, you know, 
that that Rorschach is apparently back from back from uh, the dead, but of course he, it's not really Rorschach; it's somebody else. Uh, we have we have President. This 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 whole story here is just it's so perfectly set up. We've got President uh, Robert Redford campaigning for his fourth term as president. We got this Governor Turley who wants to fight him, but there's a who wants to I'm sorry fight him who wants to defeat him to be the next president. But Vietnam is now a, is now a 52nd state in the in the Union, and uh, and it looks like President uh, Tur or Governor Turley might defeat Robert uh, President Robert Redford and prevent him from getting a fifth term. Or <laughs> and meanwhile, this whole series started off with an assassination attempt on, on Governor Turley, and the the characters that were it, it's. In issue six here, it's revealed that this comic book writer by the name of William Myerson, who created this character called uh, Pontius Pilate, along with this other character, this Laura Cummings, who is this gunslinger whose father was a conspiracy theorist who thinks that the squids control mind, like the squid, the giant squid that at the end of watching is controlling their minds. These two sort of, they're the two that attempted to, to take the life of this governor Turley. Meanwhile, this private eye that's hired by Governor Turley is trying to put it all together, and this is just this is just a uh, this entire story. It it reads so well. It's so interesting. The character moments are great. I love the dialogue. Tom King really nails the dialogue here. The, this is really in Tom King's wheelhouse because unlike what annoyed me about his Batman is that he would so often screw up the continuity and not even respect his own continuity, I would find myself getting frustrated for things that, that I knew were happening outside of the story. Here, this is in Tom King's own world, but he seems to have a very good handle on, on the original Watchmen universe, and this really fits in well to it. And again, just very impressive. And each, each individual issue is done stylistically slightly differently in terms of how he tells the tale. His masterful use of, doing, of using flashbacks and this latest issue of issue t six is really one long, you know, it's basically a letter, letters taking place between uh, the, 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 the would-be assassins of uh, Governor Turley, the Laura Cummings and the uh, William Mo Myerson character. I thought this really worked well. Again, the art is uh, fantastic. Uh, apologies. Who's the artist I, I didn't Jorge, write down there? Jorge Fornes. Hori Fernandez, yeah, great, fantastic art. In fact, when I do my thumbnails for some of my videos, I there's a lot of his uh, Fernandez's art in this series that I'm pirating. I'm using for some of my channel. I just love it. He's just done it's such a fantastic job. But uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm a little bit too uh, happy about this. What uh, what did you think of it? Yeah, to, to talk about the art. I mean, I, I'm not sure what series Tom. So I. I I should have asked him last time I, I talked to him. I, I mean, I've talked to, to Tom before about Jorge, Jorge's art. Uh, and I, 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 but I don't, I can't either. I didn't ask him or I don't remember if he told me where he first saw Jorge's art. I first saw Jorge's art on the, um, uh, the Aftershock series, Hot Lunch Special. It was written by Elliot Ray Hall. And that's a, a crime family crime noir story. It's really excellent, highly recommended. But you get a sense that that's a perfect style of story for, uh, Jorge to, to draw. And yes, Watchmen universe is superheroes, but, you know, uh, technically other than Dr. Manhattan, nobody has any, any superpowers. Um, and the, the story that Tom is telling is, as Rocky said, perfectly suited for the style of art that Jorge does. And, you know, Tom had brought Jorge over to do, you know, after seeing his art to do some, some work on Batman. Um, and Tom has told me that he thinks Jorge's art reminds him a lot of David Mazzucchelli, who, if you're a Batman, a huge Batman guy, you know that's the 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 artist that did Year One and is rightfully revered. Um, and there's a lot uh, there's a lot to that. There's a lot stylistically the same. They're not exactly the same, um, but there's a lot uh, there's a simplicity to Jorge's art that really works. So uh, in, in telling this type of story, and we we had Tom on right around Christmas time, and we talked a little bit about Rorschach and what inspired it. He mentioned you know the old. Uh, the old pulps he mentioned uh, old Hollywood movies of the 30s and 40s things like that uh, influencing what he was doing and and all that works really well and he he does a very good job like Rocky said of of capturing the the Watchmen world the cynicism cynicism of it the worn down feel that the Watchmen world has um, the only thing why I say it was a down issue is 
uh, it, it just fe- and and again, you know, you have to do this once in a while in in a uh, series, even with only twelve issues. Everything can't be a peak because if everything's a peak, then it's a plateau. You got to have things go up and down. Um, and I felt like this was a little bit of a down issue uh, because it, it felt l- a little bit like a setup issue with the letters going back and forth between this comic creator, Will Meyerson and, and uh, Laura Cummings. Um, what I got was a lot of emotion. That's what comes across. It's not necessarily moving the narrative forward. It's not necessarily story momentum, but it's setting up kind of their mindset, kind of their emotion, where they're coming from. It's, it's, it's background, it's setup. Um, and I, I think it's necessary sometimes, to, you know, and it does give you a chance to, you know, kind of sit back and catch your breath. Uh, but based on what happens in this issue, I would expect the following issue, we're going to get some big, big bombshell um, just because this is, you know, kind of a, a, a down issue in terms of sort of action or, yeah. or that kind of thing. Um, but I, I am loving the story. You know, Tom told us when when he was on that he basically wrote this all in, you know, together as one big story, one big novel, he called it. Um but it's Tom. So like, uh, like Rocky says, Tom is constantly challenging himself to tell stories in, in different ways. And he is doing that in Rorschach. Sometimes it's, you know, we're, we're getting the story played out in front of us in, in flashback on what the, this private detective is hearing from eyewitnesses. Sometimes it's what he can see himself, the events that are actually in, unfolding in real time. Other times it's these letters um, as he tries to put things together. So uh, it's going to be one of those stories that I think is going to read extremely well in trade, more yes. so than than a lot of other books might necessarily because they were written, you know, one script at a time, as opposed to this one where Tom, you know, wrote the whole script as one thing and then chopped it up into into chapters. Yeah. So, I just I want to add to that, that what, what Tom King did so masterfully and it really played out in this issue six is you really got a sense you could sympathize with the would be assassins uh, of uh, Governor Turley. You really got a sense. I mean, you could it was building up their story. The story of Laura Cummings was has been told from issue essentially issue one, as well as uh, William Myers in the comic book failed comic book writer who was, well, I guess, semi famous. But. In, in the pages of the story and how, how their lives became intersected and how they ended up ultimately becoming those, the, those uh, would be assassins and the, their ultimate fates. There's a tragedy to their story, but there's also a part of it that you can relate to, especially in these political times, quite frankly, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's funny that this is a very, you can definitely read some modern day politics in this, in this, in this issue, but yet at the same time, it doesn't feel like it's pandering or that it's forced. It actually feels like it has a, it's just telling a, a tragic story that really pulls you in. Yeah, I, I, I agree. When I, when I talk about emotion, it's, the, it's that emotion that provides the relatability, right? Cause we're getting the, the state of mind of, of Meyerson and of Cummings and we're understanding where they are, the fragility of their psyches and you know how how the world is in in different ways for each of them has kind of beat them down and so you can't help but kind of sympathize not feel sorry for them but just sympathize or empathize with where they're coming from and and and, and you do sort of feel bad for them um despite the the things that they've done these aren't mustache twirling villains uh who who uh, you know, are, are, are psychotic or, or had some, you know, crazy out there reason for doing what they were doing. Um, and so you do kind of uh, empathize with them. And the more we discover about them, I'm sure it'll, it'll you know, it, it may flip around where we just figure out that, hey, this Governor Turley, we, we don't want him to win. Because, uh, you know, at first, you know, you, you hear about him in the first issue, attempted assassination, and he's trying to knock off Redford. And you you kind of think, OK, well, you know, the United States is not supposed to be a, a monarchy. Should a, should a president really, you know, be in charge for 20, 20 years? That's what a fifth term's talking about. You're talking about 20 years, yeah. one guy in charge. So you're kind of yeah. on the side of Turley. And then we meet Turley, and he's not exactly a likable guy. So uh, exactly. much more to come. We're only halfway there. And, uh, and yeah, uh, King's been doing a, a masterful job. So uh, moving on next, we have a title that uh, I swore up and down I wasn't going to buy when it first got announced. And then my, my, my good friend, Mark Brooks, comes along with this incredible variant cover, and I, I, I just couldn't help myself, uh, and I, I kind of gave Mark a bad time for sucking me in. Um, but I did read it. I'm like, okay, well, it, it's out. It's Joker number one, written by James Tynan. The art is by Guillaume March. Arif Prianto handles the colors, and Tom Napolitano handles the letters. And I'm like, well... 
uh, I'm, I'm buying it. Let me go ahead and read it. You know, got my, my press preview copy here. And uh, it wasn't at all what I expected. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of torn on whether I should be picking up the second issue or not. So uh, give us your thoughts, Rocky, while I figure out how I want to say what I want to say about this, uh, this title. Well, it, I'm reminded of the, uh, I, I'm reminded of something that uh, James uh, Tiny in the fourth said uh, he, he, I believe he said, stated it in an email that he sent out to uh, many of his fans and uh, in regard to writing the Joker. And he, he made the comment that, you know, at first, he wasn't sure if, if that was necessarily a good idea. And he was James Tiny in his fourth is well aware of Joker fatigue that we've all sort of complained about and wondered about. And the reality is, is that uh, he struggled with it, but he did. He said he did. He came up with an approach and an idea, and he clearly did. And man, he's impressed the hell out of me with this again. I <laughs> he approached it from the from the perspective of uh, James Gordon, uh, you know, former commissioner of Gotham. And it what has happened is, of course, we had a day and a day is Arkham Asylum Day, which has uh, been play played up in the comic books and is playing out through the various uh, Batman comics. A day is the day that, uh, you know, 500, you know, 500 people are basically killed at Arkham Asylum, ranging from the various inmates to the, the doctors, the nurses, etc. It's a horrendous day. And Joker is blamed for it. And Mer Mer Nagano wants uh, of Gotham. He wants to obviously locate the Joker and, and deal with the Joker. And the problem with, with all this is that it, it does require, it does require, uh, well, obviously somebody to find the Joker. And there are this, there's this mysterious third, there's this mysterious third party represented by this beautiful woman that approaches <laughs> James Gordon, uh, commissioner, you know, former commissioner Gordon to try to locate the Joker. And they make him a very interesting proposition. And, what, what James Tiny in the fourth does so masterfully here is that he he starts off the story by showing a young James Gordon uh, being when he was just a cop being sort of confronted by an old an older more experienced cop asking him you know have you ever have you ever seen evil do you know, yeah. you know what do that you, is do you believe in evil right do you believe in evil and that might seem somewhat tropey because I know we get that a lot in, in a lot of site you know a lot of thrillers we see in movies and everything else it's it's kind of a classical tropey line but it really works here uh, in my belief it, I believe it works very well because it's commissioner you know former commissioner Gordon reflecting on that he's retired now and but he's still, even though he's got gray hair and even though he alludes to the fact that he was dyeing his hair red to look younger and which explains some of the continuity issues, maybe the fact that he's actually engaging and he still wants to, he, he's still in the back of his head. He's an older guy now, but he still wants to take down the Joker. He's still that good guy in him. He needs to, if he has an opportunity to find the Joker and take him down, he's going to take it. And so when he's made the offer, when he's given the offer by this mysterious third party represented by this beautiful woman to, you know, take down the Joker, but to, and, and kill him. I mean, they're going to pay him 25 million bucks to do it. It's an enticing offer, but of course it's James Gordon, even though he's got little save for retirement. It's not, it's never about money with him because he's genuinely a good, he's, you know, that's his strong moral fiber coming through, but he's at a lot of loss. He, he, the Joker's indirectly responsible for the loss of his son, for, for uh, crippling, uh, crippling his daughter, uh, Barbara Gordon, putting her in, you know, compelling her to become Oracle at one point. And he, it's true. The Joker screwed up his life in more ways than one, but still now here's the temptation. We always talk about the temptation of Batman to kill the Joker. Well, finally we're getting James, you know, commissioner Gordon, former commissioner Gordon. He's the one being tested here. All right, buddy. Okay. You got all these moral, you great moral fiber. You won't kill the Joker. Here's 25 million bucks. You see, Go find the Joker. You sure you don't want to help us out? I mean, I really like he's being tested here. And I love the fact that it's alluded to the, to the fact that I think all of us suspect very strongly that the Joker's innocent. That Joker didn't have anything to do with what happened in Markham Asylum. And even the Joker seems to laugh at the end when he reads the paper, he reads about what happened at Arkham. Even the Joker's surprised. Cause I don't think, I don't think, cause I think it's fair to say that it's probably set up by the scarecrow. The magistrate is, is who was responsible for what happened at Arkham Asylum. We know that from future state. So 
I really like the setup here. I really enjoyed this. Uh, Gillian March's art is fantastic. It, it was perfect for the mood. And he does a great job of showing a, a younger James, James Gordon and an older James Gordon. Emotionally, Channing the Fourth did a good job of showing the, 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 the you, you got a good sense of why James Gordon feels the way he does about this and how passionate he is about it. And you feel his pain. You feel the internal struggle with James, with James Gordon, having lost a son, having had a daughter who was crippled, and, and he himself, who's, who's, who's now divorced and single and has nothing saved, all the big fight, the big never-ending battle. And for what? He's got nothing to show for it, and the Joker is still thriving. So now this temptation to take the Joker down, to kill him, because that's the condition. You got to kill him. But here's 25 million bucks to cushion your the blow to your moral moral attitude. I really like this. Again, highest compliments to James Tiny in the fourth man. I said it before. I've I've been sort of an outlier in certain circles on really liking Kinian's Batman, but this just makes me love it all the more. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you 100 percent Um it's intriguing, first of all. Um and it, it the the fact that he has, you know, his son died, Joker's fault. His daughter almost died, crippled, lost loose, loose use of her legs, uh, Joker's fault. Gordon himself has been tortured and captured by the Joker multiple times, multiple times. Um, not to mention all the trauma he had to deal with when he was the commissioner, you know, and, and indirect trauma, you know, not necessarily trauma inflicted on him or his family, but indirect trauma. That he had to and stress from from being on the job, so I, I agree with with all of that. So, two questions, Rocky. Before I give my further thoughts on the book, would you kill the Joker for twenty five million dollars? Does a bear shit in the woods? Yeah, you're right there yeah. with you, buddy. No, I, I, honestly, it wouldn't it wouldn't even be a hesitation to me. Yep. Uh, it, it, no, it would it would be a no brainer. Of course, I would. I, of course, yeah. I would. And, yeah. and the thing is, this isn't. It, it's not even. You, you and it's not even a as far as i'm concerned it's not a contrary and yeah it is the lawyer and me talking now uh contrary to what commissioner gordon might say in comic books in the batman it's not actually murder it would be fully justified and you know and it would be fairly easy to set up i mean you, what jury would convict i mean yeah come on. exactly exactly <laughs> come on. and and I, I i don't i don't care if the joker had nothing to do with a day because i agree with you it's totally being set up that he probably didn't do that but for any of the thousands of other things that he's done yeah, you're gone, buddy. You're gone. Yeah. No, like no, no two ways about it. Uh, my other question is, just based on this first issue, do you think this is a a Joker comic or is this a a, a James Gordon comic? Well, uh, that that actually is a question that James Tiny the Fourth himself answered, and that this this was very intentional by Tinian. Uh, he deliberately is approaching the story in this way, telling a Joker story through the through the eyes of of Jim Gordon. That was that was the approach he took. And the reason he took that approach was that he wanted to do something different because and this is me reading into the uh, what he had stated in in his email that he sent out to fans. And that is that he he is aware of he's aware of the complaints about Joker fatigue. And when he was first approached by DC to write a Joker, he, his first concern was, well, aren't, aren't fans, you know, he's aware of it. He listens, you know, aren't readers sick and tired of the Joker? We got the Batman who laughs. We've had two years of this. We got the, I mean, well, I, you know, we, we don't want to alienate readership. And so he, he wanted to approach it in a way that it was not just about the Joker. It was about, you know, you know, maybe show some focus on someone else. And, to his credit, masterfully done, James Tynion, man, I'm impressed. He, I'm actually, I'm more interested in Jim, James Gordon and, and what a compliment to James Tiny in the fourth that this is called the Joker, but people are going to get a bonus plan when they read it because they're going to get to, I think they're really going to get to like to, uh, they're going to get a good handle on commissioner, former commissioner Gordon. Yeah. So Manny, our, our, our co-host who joins us at times, his favorite Batman character is commissioner Gordon. So he, mm. he's going to be over the moon and you're right. Tynan did um, address this in his newsletter that he puts out. Uh, I, I encourage you guys to go and sign up because Tynan talks about all his various work that he does in, in the newsletter. It's very informative. And actually a lot of times news, he breaks news there before it's on other, other places. And, and then his newsletter comes out and then other, 
uh, comic book news sites pull from his newsletter and write their articles. So, you know, if you sign up for it, you'll, you'll get the news first. Uh, but it is, it does have me thinking that, yeah, maybe because I, I get the newsletter and I read the same thing that, that Rocky's talking about, but I, I had my, um, I had my doubts whether or not he would be able to, to do it, to have it focused. And let's all face it. If you, if you had come out with this story and called it Jim Gordon or, you know, Gordon's pursuit or, you know, whatever Gordon's quest, the sales would have been minuscule compared to what they'll be when it says the Joker. But that doesn't mean you can't still tell the James Gordon story as long as it's a good story. And this is a good story. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I am a little torn because I don't, like the level, the amount, the volume of Joker we got in this, in this first issue is to me just about the perfect amount of Joker that I can handle in this story. <laughs> if he starts being a, a, a more of a main character and shows up a little more, then I, I don't know. I just don't know if it can hold my interest. But I think as long as Gordon stays the focal point um, and with that moral conundrum that neither Rocky nor I would share – and I kind of don't, feel, <laughs> I don't feel like Jim Gordon would, would, uh, you know, feel that way either. Cause to Rocky's point, this guy has been through hell. He and his family have been through hell and he's got nothing to show for it. Like Rocky just said, like this guy doesn't even have a, he's barely drawn a pen, can barely afford the rent on his, you know, flea bag uh, apartment. So <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it, it's not, it's a no brainer for me. But, you know, when it comes time to pull that trigger, I mean, I've never killed anybody. I mean, hope that doesn't come as a surprise. Uh, I don't know what I'd actually do. I, I don't know what I actually do in that moment. You know, you say, yeah, I would take out this serial killer or mass murder or whatever. But until you're right there, gun in hand, you know, about to end the life of a fellow human being, I don't think any of us can really say what we would do in that moment. Um, but this is a great story. I was really surprised how little Joker was in it uh, and how much Jim Gordon was in it. Um, despite what Tynan had said, you know, I'm like, okay, we're going to get some kind of framework of, um, Jim Gordon going in pursuit of him. But no, this, this was way more than that. This was diving into Jim Gordon's psyche, diving into uh, his life and, and the repercussions of the choices he's made in his life to put others first and the sacrifices he's made. Now he finally has a chance to get paid, get yeah. paid, Jimmy, 25 yeah, I, mil, man. Yeah, what? Joker's yeah. life to me isn't worth 25 cents. So. <laughs> Exactly. But I, and I'm just going to add that one of the things I'm looking forward to is I want I want Jim Gordon to get some love here because yep. the guy's a genius detective. And, you know, it's because he's always he's always almost like a de facto sidekick to Batman all the time. But the fact of the matter is Jim Gordon is actually in many ways he's better than Batman. Because he doesn't, Jim Gordon doesn't have the luxury to, to be able to hide in behind a secret identity and a, and a billion dollars in a bat cave and uh, be able to just sort of like, you know, escape his life and be a millionaire, billionaire playboy. And, and now I realize Batman is no longer a billionaire, but you, my point is still made that quite frankly, I, I like the fact that James Jim Gordon has never removed the filter. He's never really went full bore on the Joker. He's always wrote on. He's always had the luxury of writing on the coattails of Batman, not because he chose to, but because he had no choice because Batman and Joker were always doing their thing. But the fact of the matter is I'm looking forward to this because I want to see I want to see the best of Jim Gordon. And I think he's as good as Batman. And yeah, I agree. I, that's I mean, what I'm hoping to see. Yeah, I mean, he took over as Batman when Bruce Wayne was supposedly dead at the end of the Snyder. Thank you. Thank and, you and for Capullo. that. That's right. Yeah. He did. And he was also a major player in uh, in Batman Eternal, the first weekly Batman series. Yeah. And in fact, I was talking about Manny loving Bat, uh, Jim Gordon so much um, that that cover, that Jason Fabok cover of Jim Gordon is like one of Manny's favorite covers of any comic ever. And yeah. it's Batman's nowhere in sight. It's just Gordon. So. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a great read. Um, what, what I was much less interested in and didn't quite hit the spot, maybe because it was more Joker centric was the, the backup story. Uh, for me, it, it's all about punchline and, you know, Manny and I have talked about it before. Uh, it is very much, um, kind of pulled from the headlines, uh, in terms of, you know, what is true and what is not, and people getting away with, absolute murder basically because of social media and perceptions and all that 
So Punchline's on trial. That's the story going on here. It's written by Sam Johns and James Tynan. Art is by Mirka Andolfo, which the art I, I thought was excellent. Colors by Ramulo Fajardo Jr. are also very well done. The letters are by Ariana Marr. Um, and there is a little editor's note. Story follows the events of the Punchline One special, which is when we first hear about her having gone on trial. And uh, it, it, just in case there's any doubt that Punchline is a real piece of crap, by the way, there is a, a sequence in this story about her in, uh, you know, in prison or in jail while she's uh, going through her trial and acting like a complete psychopath, which really kind of goes against everything she's using as her defense. Oh, I was just a victim too, and blah, blah, blah. And then, um, you know, Tynan and, and, um, and John's put that, uh, that in there going, uh, just, so you, just so everybody knows, in case you aren't familiar with Punchline, she's lying through her teeth. She did kill people. She was a willing participant. She's not a victim. In fact, she is a piece of crap, just like the Joker is. So uh, I guess in that way, Punchline Chapter 1 is, is useful, but I didn't need to be reminded of that. I know Punchline is a piece of crap. And, uh, you know, I've talked before about how I'm not really interested in her as a, as a character. She feels like just a, a Harley replacement since they've taken Harley and, and turned her into a hero, basically. Um, well, so, uh, yeah, uh, well, it, it, it's fine. It's a fine story. Uh, I could easily see myself going forward to continue to read the Joker and just skip the the backup story. Well, I would, uh, Jace, I would just, I would just give you a little bit of pushback on that and say, uh, on the one hand, I've also said the same line as you that you just said about how she's kind of like a, a wannabe Harley. But at the same time, I always hold myself accountable when I say that. And I hold you accountable too, because punchline is not Harley. Uh, she isn't. And, and, and I think that, I think that, Tini in the fourth is trying to draw a very obvious distinction between punchline and Harley. Harley was always Harley always had a, had some humor or some craziness about her. And she had some fun aspects to her punchline is just a vindictive, hateful woman. And there, this is, this is the darkest. If this is Harley, this is the darkest version of Harley. You can imagine there's, there's no smiles here. There's no laughter. There's no smiles. There's no sense of humor with punchline. That's sort of the irony of her name is that there's really nothing funny or, or fun about punchline at all. She's just a, she's just an, she's just a manipulator and she utilizes, she's the product of our times. And I think that's why I find her a fascinating character. Uh, so I, I hate her. I hate her as a person if she existed in real life, but as a character, I love her because we need her. She's a reminder of the darkest aspects of online BSers that we see all the time. <laughs> yeah, I don't, really need a remi- I don't need a reminder. And, and I agree with well, you. She's, she's not a Harley replacement. I don't, I don't think right. I said that. Uh, she's a yeah. har- She's the, the alternative, as I said to, yeah. to Harley, she's Fair the female enough. version of, of the Joker. And, yeah. and, and in that way, she knows she doesn't replace Harley in, in terms of, Hey, here's the next version of Harley. She replaces Harley and here's a female sidekick for the, for the Joker. Um, and I talked about it when it first came online, kind of the, the problematic things about Harley's uh, relationship with the Joker, you know, being in an abusive yeah. relationship and, and that sort of thing. Um, and wondering if DC was making the right choice yeah. and once again, giving the Joker a, a female sidekick. Um, she's much less a sidekick and more just like a female version of the Joker and is well, not, not set up to be that kind of abuser, abusey relationship. So you're right. She's not a oh. Harley replacement, she, but she is a, a an alternative to, to Harley in terms of being a female sidekick for him, but I, I still don't like her. Well, here's, here's my criticism of the backup of, of the punchline chapter one uh, written by Sam Johns and James, uh, who also wrote it with James Tiny in the fourth. I, I really like the art Mark Mark and Dolfo. I her arts growing on me. I love the colors by Raw Middle for Judo jr. One thing, my criticism of the story is that I don't think punchline would have the, the story basically consists of punchline in jail you know, while, while, while she's, you know, while the witnesses against her seem to be being killed off outside the, you know, while she's in jail, she's, she beats up, uh, she beats off the queen. She beats off, beats off, sorry. She beats up the queen of spades, who is a member of the, uh, the Royal flush gang in, in prison. But in my view, it would have been a better narrative choice if, if the writers would have had punchline intentionally provoke the queen of spades and let herself get beat up in order to generate sympathy. That would have made more sense to me, far more sense to me for the narrative that they want to establish. Uh, It didn't make, you know, I mean, 
for punchline to i mean punchline is easily uh, she's a very skilled hand to hand combat uh, c- combatant she she took out harley quinn at one point uh she's at least harley quinn's equal uh arguably and so, but I think that she's also very intelligent and she's very manipulative. And so I was, I was a little disappointed that they had punchline. I thought it was a little tropey having punchline, just do the, the bad girl thing in prison. I thought it would have been much more intelligent for her to, to have let herself get beat up, generate sympathy for a court case. I thought that would have been more in keeping with the storyline that they want to tell. Cause I think the writing's on the wall here that, that even though we have bluebird, uh, you know, Harper and her, um, uh, uh, who's working with Leslie Tompkins to try to convict Punchline? I think it would have went farther had had their had the writer had they continue to generate sympathy for Punchline through Punchline's machinations and her manipulations. In other words, build up readership hatred. Frankly, Jace, the fact that you hate Punchline, I think that's exactly what they're hoping that they want. I think that's working because you kind of hate her, but I don't know. There's a difference between hating a character versus hating to see a character, you know, at least for me. And maybe it's different for you, but it's sort of like Darth Vader. I, I love to hate Darth Vader in a comic book, but every time he shows up, he's such he's so goddamn interesting. I got to read the story punchline. I, I don't want her to become sort of a well, I don't want her to become a one liner. I don't want her to become tropey. I want her to be a manipulative bitch where you don't exactly know what's happening a true genuine offspring uh, narratively speaking of the Joker. And I'm, uh, you know, so I'm a little disappointed with that, that approach they took with punchline, but I'm hoping things will get better as we move forward. Yeah. It would have been way more interesting had she gotten beat up and then come back later, you know, chapter two down the line after she's gone to court with her bruises and generated that sympathy, then, then, Hey, maybe the queen of uh, a space tried to tries to beat her up again. And this time, Punchline's like, uh, you know, already got the bruises, already got the sympathy, and then gives her the smackdown. Yeah, that would have been way more interesting. You're right. Uh, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, next book, we're going to talk about Wonder Woman number 770. This is written by uh, Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad. The art is by Travis Moore, colors by Tamara Bonvillain, letters by Pat Brousseau. Uh, and so I guess this is following on the pages of us seeing Wonder Woman go on tour of the DC Universe in Infinity uh, or infinite frontier uh, zero rather. Um, but this is a, a, a brand new start and a whole new world for, for Wonder Woman. She's, she's literally showing up in the, the halls of Valhalla as it were. And in fact, um, on the cover, it says vexed by the Val, Val vexed by the Vikings of Valhalla. I can't even say it. Um, and then there is a backup featuring uh, the adventures of young Diana that's written by Jordi Belair, known for her, uh, her mostly her color work. Uh, but she has uh, written some comics in the past, and DC's given her uh, a chance to write uh, a story with a young Wonder Woman, which is very, very much uh, almost the style of like DC superhero girls. Um, it, and, and that's kind of the, the thing I, I thought about the backup. The, the first story is so mature, and we'll talk about it in detail in a second. And the second story is so not. Um, so uh, I, I would never recommend to a parent, hey, go and buy this for your six, seven, eight, nine year old daughter to read about young Diana, um, because that the, I think that first story is too mature for them. So they, they, they don't feel like they go together. I think this young Diana birthday blues story written by Jordi Belair. Uh, I should say the artwork is by Polina Ganeshaw, colors by Kendall Good, and letters by Becca Carey. That's perfectly suited for a young reader. Uh, and, and I know plenty of young readers, including my own nine-year-old daughter, who love Wonder Woman. And she would love this story, but I can't give her this comic to read. I mean, I guess I could and say, hey, just read from here on. Um, but I can't expect parents to go out and you know spend whatever it is, five, six bucks on this, because the, the young Diana story is, is so perfectly suited because it's so much shorter it's only six or eight pages of the first chapter here um so i i I, i'm not sure what dc's trying to do if you're going to give a backup story i think it has to be pretty close in um in tone and and age appropriate as the the main story is so it's a it's a little nitpick um and and it is fun the backup story is fun uh for what it is uh but the real draw here is the main story so uh, i'll shut up and let you give our uh your thoughts on the the main story rock (laughs) Uh, again, man, I, I, I'm trying to be constructively critical here, 
but I'm once again, I got a big shit eating grin on my face. I just love this. This was this to me. This was Vikings meets Game of Thrones meets Wonder Woman meets Disney's Frost. Uh, it had a little bit of everything. This main story by Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad. And look, I was very hard on my Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad. I thought their future state Wonder Woman uh, was was Terrible? was was narratively not very good. I love Becky. I loved uh, um, Jen Bartel's art on Immortal Wonder Woman, but boy, I thought the story really suffered. But uh, I'm I'm so happy to report that this is just this is fun. This this issue starts off. This starts off Wonder Woman seven seventy starts off with Wonder Woman waking up in Asgard, or she, she pardon me, she's waking up in Valhalla, which is heaven, which is where all the all the Norse gods. Uh, all the all the all the Vikings who worship Norse mythology, they would fight in order they would fight in order to wake up in in, in Valhalla, where every day in Valhalla you fight a battle, and at the end of the battle you you you, you get killed, and you wake up in a in in a tavern, and you drink to your heart's content, and you make love to beautiful women and wenches and whatever you want, and it's a ridiculously chauvinistic yet chivalric way to live. That's what you do, and. This is very much tied up in lore. And this involves Wonder Woman waking up. She's in the midst of a battle and she's greeted by a, a character by the name of Sigurd Siegfried, who I Googled. I did Google. And apparently uh, Sigurd Siegfried is a Germanic uh, heroic legend who in uh, Norse mythology killed a dragon, uh, killed is known for killing a dragon. And he's got a cloak of invisibility. And no man was equal to him in strength or courage or courtesy or, or boldness or generosity. And he was, he was considered one of the greatest heroes of, of, of Germanic mythology. And, and he's very much a, a character here who him, Diana right away forms a bond with him in this, in this issue. And, but she doesn't have a memory of her past and she doesn't have any of her powers. And she ends up getting killed in battle multiple, more than once in this issue because she keeps forgetting that she doesn't have her invulnerability. She doesn't have her super. She doesn't have her her powers that were given to her by Mother Gaia. And and, and the art here by Travis Moore, absolutely gorgeous, sexy, violent, and perfectly suited for this fantastical tale. And you know, it's funny. I just finished watching the final season of Vikings with with the wife, and I really got a sense of this here. And uh, I just kept thinking of Ragnarok, and I kept thinking of Ragnar on the on the series Viking, and I I just enjoyed this. And this, you know, this clearly there there's a force here that every time Diana is killed in this issue, she sort of has a vision of there's a third party, an unknown force that's talking to her, saying. You're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to be on Olympus. And of course, Olympus is a different mythology. We got Norse mythology, then Olympus is Greek mythology. And so we got a mixture of mythologies going on here, which I find interesting. And, I, and so my compliments to Becky Clooney and to Michael Conrad, I'm assuming they they put more thought into this and I'm, than they did with the Immortal Wonder Woman story, which, you know, I, I can't believe it's the same writer, to be very blunt with you. Artistically, narratively, I'm really curious what's going on. In the midst of all this, Wonder Woman goes out. She ends up meeting a squirrel, for God's sakes. All of a sudden, there's a talking squirrel. And that might seem ridiculous hearing it on, on, the, on, this, on this podcast. <laughs> but, but it just seems, but, but it actually kind of makes sense in the crazy kind of way because Wonder Woman's trying to figure out what's going on. And we, the readers, we're, we're as curious as to the mystery as the rest of it. And... And I'm along for the ride here. I'm really curious. It, it 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 ends, you know. There's there's talk of Ragnarok, which is like the ultimate battle. It's the final battle that that everyone is working toward. And Wonder Woman ultimately, in in, in she keeps coming back. It ends with you know with the mystery is that we still don't know exactly what's going on, but we know that Wonder Woman has to at some point get out of the sort of this this sort of trap that she's in and we have this tree of life that is playing a part of it and this whole cycle it's almost like groundhog day it's like fight die party in hell rinse and repeat you know she does the same thing over and over again and uh there, there's beautiful scenes here there's even a hint at a at uh, siegfried being a love interest for wonder woman and again 
this put a shitty green smile on my face. I it's been a long time since I loved a Wonder Woman comic, but I really enjoyed this. Yeah, uh, I got to be careful not to fall into the the trap I fell into with uh, uh, Marika Tamaki and Mikhail Yanin's first Wonder Woman book when I declared it a brand new era and it was going to be the best era of Wonder Woman ever. And <laughs> God, it just went in the toilet and like so quickly uh, I, I I was. Yeah, I, I was wrong. So I, I'm not going to make such a bold statement here, but this is a very technically well put together book. Uh, the art is absolutely spectacular. Uh, my, my hat's off to Travis Moore for uh, doing such a great job with all. I mean, these these battles, you know, there's so much action going on. There's so many characters, so much detail. Uh, he put a lot of work in. There's no, there's no doubt about that. The idea of these warriors who live for battle going out and having fun. This is fun for them to go out and fight to the death, knowing that they're going to be revived the next day. I mean, that's, that's cool. That's great. It's fun. Um, and it, it is borrowing from, you know, other mythologies, not Greek mythology, like wonder woman is based on, but, but um, you know, North, yeah, North mythology. And it's, it, and it's wonderful to see um, also the stylistic choice to show the the after i mean she's she's already supposedly you know dead in valhalla or what what have you or warriors go when they die but then like rocky said there's somebody else behind the strings pulling it and when she does die in battle uh choosing to show that stylistically in just black and white is inspired it, it, it separates it out it, it gives it weight it uh, makes it stand out it's such a stark contrast to the rest of the book in terms of color and line work and it's much more simple um and beautiful and and, and it's great um and so I, I love that complete mystery. We don't know how Wonder Woman got from the pages of uh, Infinite Frontier Zero to here. Um, she obviously doesn't remember. She doesn't even remember she's Wonder Woman. So, you know, there's a mystery to be solved. How, what answers will we get? Um, that could be the one sort of nitpick that I'd have. Uh, I don't begrudge the uh, creators for, for doing that and basically putting us, throwing us in the middle of the story without any answers. Uh, and I'm on board. But I could see some people picking it up and going, well, this doesn't make any sense. You know, Wonder Woman 769, if you didn't read any of the other stuff, you didn't read any Future State, you didn't pick up Infinite Frontier uh, Zero, you're like, you know, what the heck's going on? I, this is, you know, Wonder Woman has gotten to be garbage and, just, and drop it. I, I could see that happening. Uh, I hope people don't do that because I, I think it's probably worth your while to hang out, keep reading it and see where it goes. So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an intriguing start. Won't say I'm 100% on board yet, um, but I guess I guess we'll see. I, I do like kind of the the tone of the story that uh, Conrad and Clunan are giving us here, um, but I can't say whether or not they have the they have Wonder Woman's voice down yet because we haven't. Re she doesn't even know she's Wonder Woman, you know. So that's yeah. still something of you know. I want to make sure they understand at her core who Diana is, and and they're sort of uh, authentic with her voice but we may not know that for several issues until diana herself finds out who she is maybe this is uh you know her her journey to discover who she is um in that way maybe this is the their version of what uh, kelly sue DeConnick did with aquaman when he lost you know after the the events of um drowned earth when he supposedly yeah. died and you know was in some sort of afterlife trapped on um the Isle of Water, whatever it was called, and and had to you know get his memories back and kind of rediscover him. I mean, it's a classic thing that, that writers do. They tear a character down so they can build them back up, remind us who they are at, at the center. So yeah, I thought it was uh thought it was really great. I already mentioned my thoughts on the the backup. Anything to say about the backup on your end, Rock? Uh, honestly, the backup. Uh, I share your sentiment that it was such a jarring shift in tone and everything. I mean, it's it's like literally. It's like watching an R-rated horror flick and then jumping to a lighthearted general G-rated comedy or G-rated show. It, 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 this is very much out of place. These two stories should not be in the same comic book. And, and that's not an insult to either story. This is actually a nice story. I would I would happily give this to any, you know, any young young woman wants to, wants to read about Wonder Woman. But we have a story with Wonder Woman at the end of her life in 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 Valhalla, uh, taking place ahead of a story of Wonder Woman in her younger years that involves her hopping around on jump by the kangaroo I mean, <laughs> Themyscira, clearly drawn, beautifully drawn. Like I, I think beautifully drawn 
for for the for, for the story it's telling and uh my my apologies i uh, i'm trying to or it's uh the writer jordi Belair. okay art by paula paula ganucho uh you know i guess it's written by the same writer which is interesting uh it just it just feels very different it feels like it shouldn't be in the same comic book yep, and but again i don't mind the story i don't mind the story it just feels like it was very hard for me I, I was so excited by the time I, when I was done reading the first one, because I want to know what's happening on Valhalla and what the secret is and who that, who's that mysterious force. And is, is one woman can't die again. Cause she, the more time she dies in, in Valhalla, the, the harder it's going to be for her to escape. And there's a, you know, and, and, and I'm excited about that. And I got that on the brain. And then all of a sudden to go from that to kangaroo to a jump of the kangaroo, it just, <laughs> it didn't feel right, but that's not the fault of the story itself. Because the story itself was okay. It was just, to me, it's like they're trying to cater to an older Wonder Woman audience and a younger and a decidedly different Wonder Woman audience all in the same comic. And I don't know, I guess I'm not really, I'm not so much on board for it. I give compliments to Jordi Belair, how she can sort of like jump ship like that to the, she's the same writer that wrote the first story and then she's writing the second. Uh, now, the it, first story was Michael W. Conrad and, and, um, and uh, Becky, oh, Becky Cloonan. Becky oh, yeah. Cloonan. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jordi Belair usually does colors. That's colors. She... Yeah. Yeah. She's a color so artist. That's, yeah. That's actually interesting because uh, we I I uh, thank you for correcting me because I'm I'm we're always complimenting Jordi Belair on colors. And this is her doing a trying. A, that makes more sense to me now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this isn't her first comic work. She's even done. She's got a creator own title, I think. And, and uh, she's I think she's even written something for DC before in one of the recent anthologies. So it's great to well, see her getting getting a chance sure. to right um because yeah i think i think she does a good job the dialogue is good the, the it's yeah. well paced but it's clearly for young readers and like you said it's not i mean it's not at all they're these these books are not at all intended for the same age range so it, yeah they kind of don't belong now hopefully dc when they go to collect these you know they'll be collected separate and then in that way it can work like you can just buy the the collected edition for the younger readers and if you want the you know main wonder woman yeah. story you can you can do that as well so uh, all right. Well, before we move on to uh, the the last book we're going to talk about today, I do want to remind everybody uh, that uh, we did we did have a, a a bad idea takeover last Sunday uh, on the on the podcast. So Rocky joined us to talk about ENIAC number one uh, with uh, bad idea, and uh, it's it's one of our most popular recent episodes. So we, we must have done something right. So uh, just remind everybody, go check that out. Uh, no, a lot of not not a lot of people know about Bad Idea as a publisher, but man, their stories are are fantastic. And coming up in just a couple of days, uh, in the second episode of the Bad Idea Takeover, we're going to have uh, Dinesh Shamdasani and Warren Simons, the co CEOs and co publishers of, uh, or I should say, co CEOs and and co editor in chiefs of Bad Idea, talk to us about launch day and what to expect coming up. So be sure and go and check out that uh, episode as well. So uh, on to the last book that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it is Batman Urban Legends, the new Batman anthology story. We have uh, four four tales in this one. Uh, the first is a, a Red Hood story. It's called Cheer Part One. Uh, Chip Zdarsky writes, Eddie Barrows handles pencils, Eber Ferrero on inks. Marcus Toe does the flashbacks. We have colors by Adriana Lucas and letters by Becca Carey. There's a Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy story called New Roots, written by Stephanie Phillips, art by Laura Braga, colors by Yvonne Placencia, and letters by Darren Bennett. An outsider story called Caretakers, written by Brandon Thomas. Max Dunbar is the artist. Luis Guerrero on colors. Steve Wands on letters. And then uh, we finish up with a grifter story, part one of five of The Long Con, written by Matthew Rosenberg, art by Ryan Benjamin, colors by Antonio Fabella, and letters by Seda Timofonte. So uh, I guess we'll go story by story here, Rock, and, uh, and give it a... Uh, I, I, just, I just want to clarify, are we... Uh, are, we're, not, we're not reviewing Justice League? No, Justice League's next week. That's next week. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Yeah, Justice League and Nightwing uh, next week. Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, I... Yeah, we're going story by story. Do you want me to start off? Yeah, or? yeah, go ahead. Give us your thoughts on uh, on the Red Hood story by Zdarsky. 
Well, uh, first of all, you know, all this talk about Bat, you know, DC publishing too much Batman. I think DC's come up with a solution. They, they've decided to cram all these great Batman stories in one comic book. <laughs> so so they've they've eliminated the, you know, uh, make no mistake, people. There's still a lot of Batman stories out there and it's just crammed into Batman Urban Legends. There's a lot of com there's a lot of great stories in Batman Urban Legends. This gets one of my highest recommendations. Batman Urban Legends, number one, people pick it up. First story, Batman Urban Legends by Chip Sardosky, uh, Eddie Burrows and uh, e Eber Ferrero on the art with Marcus Toe doing some of the uh, back background or the flashback sequences. I, I'm, I'm impressed with Chip Sardosky here. Now, he normally is somebody who's done a lot of Marvel work. Uh, most people will recognize his Marvel work uh, going back the last few years. And, of course, his independent work on, on such titles as... Uh, uh, Stillwater. Thank you. Stillwater. Yes, that's that's the one that I've been reading lately and I'm loving and I completely forgot. But in any event, I'm impressed. He actually knows his he knows his Jason Todd. I, this was a really good story. Uh, this story involves Jason Todd just doing an investigation, invest trying to get to the heart of a new drug that's going around Gotham City called Cheer Cheer Drops. I love and that name. Yeah, cheer drops. It is. Yeah. It, does, it sort of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's too bad it's the name of a drug, but it's a good yeah. name for a drug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it creates a lot of euphoria. Uh, but it also, unfortunately, uh, has people sort of imagine their 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 wildest or their 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 wildest fantasy come to life, and so it 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 unfortunately it leads ultimately to self harm, and. And as Jason Todd is looking through this, wh where this really works is uh, Sardaski really does a great job with the character work here. And just with Jason Todd reflecting back on his d early days as Robin. And I, I, I love, I love, I particularly love one sequence that I thought was very well laid out by Sardaski. And again, beautifully illustrated by Eddie Burroughs. And uh, uh, I guess uh, maybe it was Marcus Todd because it was a flashback sequence. Just how looking back, you know, you know, Jason Todd, he makes reference to the fact that as Robin, he always dressed in these flamboyant colors. And yet Batman was the one that was dressed up looking fearful. And so Batman had the extra weapon of instilling fear in people. Yet Robin was always the circus guy in, in, in tights and colorful tights. And so Batman, even in terms of his wardrobe, had the advantage. And I really like the fact that Zardaski sort of references that because it's true, you know, you know, because people sometimes forget that Batman looks far more intimidating than Robin does. If you look at it from a purely wardrobe perspective, <laughs> I mean, Batman is all dark and brooding. Robin is, you know, in his skin, little tights and his shorts and, and everything else. Well, that's what Jason Todd, you know, Jason Todd, he was this flamboyant, colorful character when he was Robin, but he also had, he also had a fear in him. And he, he also had, he was inclined to, to, to be more aggressive he had an aggression and an anger in him that alfred pennyworth and batman bruce wayne were unable to eliminate from jason todd and, and that anger that jason todd has has always defined him and we even saw that in the in the in the jeff john's story of three jokers the jason todd's anger and his his you know he it, it comes from some other place and it's it's not Batman's fault or Alfred Pennyworth's uh, fault, but but it's there. And I think Zardaski does a really good job of drawing that out in this story. And uh, it really drives home Batman's own perceptions of failure. Bruce Wayne, Batman, not just Batman, but the Bruce Wayne aspect of Batman feels like he has failed Jason Todd. And that perception of failing your son, failing your child. And make no mistake, Batman views Jason Todd as one of his kids. That's made uh, very clear here. This really shone through here. And they, of course... Both Batman and Jason Todd end up on a on a collision course because they're both coming to they're they're both heading toward finding out who is ultimately uh, leading who is selling these cheer drops and and it's really heightened through through Jason Todd, you know, saving the life of a you know uh, of a young boy whose mother is overdosed on cheer on on these cheer drops, and and the the mat and of course his reckoning with the father and him finding this, this in his quest to find this young child's father. Uh, of course, the revelation that this father is very much an a-hole and ultimately what, one of the ones responsible for the trafficking of this horrible drug. It's, I thought this was an emotionally resonant issue. This was 
I thought this was so well written. And again, I'm sounding like a broken record here. I'm so happy this week with DC, man. I just, I'm so happy. I'll, I'll let you talk now, Jace. I, I don't know. I, I hope you share my happiness with this. Otherwise, I'm going I, crazy. I, yeah, this is one of my favorite Red Hood stories I've read in a in a really long time. You know, it's so Sadarsky's so interesting to me. I mean, here's a guy always with the one liners, always cracking jokes, a, a real kind of class clown sort of personality. Uh, but when you read his Daredevil, when you read this Red Hood story, it's it's there's so much angst, there's so much emotion, there's so much kind of sadness and poignancy. It's like, where the heck is this coming from? <laughs> like, uh, it, it's, I mean, is, is the Darsky the modern day, you know, Pagliacci? Uh, I mean, this guy, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. unbelievable what he's doing, you know? Um, yeah. it, so I thought, you know, going back, cause you're right, Jason Todd, he does have that anger. Um, and I think it stems from his, his childhood feeling that he just inherently knew he was worth more. Um, and maybe he, he could have, uh, overcome that anger eventually if he hadn't died at the, the hands of the Joker, you know, with, we know when he, when uh, Batman, and, and again, this is all post-crisis when his origin got changed a little bit, stealing the the hubcaps off the Batmobile or, or what have you. And Batman takes him in and he's very angry and he starts to temper that anger and, and starts to be trained to become Robin. Um, and we see a little bit of flashback here and Zdarsky's talking about how that anger was, was still there. And, and, you know, he didn't see things as, as being fair uh, in terms of, hey, why why am I the brightly colored distraction like um, Rocky was alluding to, um, but at least starting to get some self-worth and then to have him killed at the hands of the Joker and and sort of subconsciously feel like he was let down by his father, just like he was let down by his biological mother. Um, you know, that's where that that angst is is coming from. That's where that um, that sort of sadness and that that simmering anger that's always under the surface because he does feel let down, which I think uh, feeds into his, some, some sort of issues of self-esteem and self-worth that are inherent to him, you know, as a, as a character. Um, and, and the fact that at a very young age, he did really have to, to look after himself. So he's always going to be the character that's walking around with his chip on his shoulder. Yeah. And uh, we kind of see that manifested in the scene or the flashback scene early on where he's looking at, this he finds this cache of guns that batman has right like wait i thought you hated guns why do you have this room that's you know wall-to-wall -wall guns and uh batman says i do hate guns uh but i need these because i need to know them i need to master everything i need it for my forensics work um i have to understand how how guns work uh, but these aren't for you you know and so you know it just puts that thought into um into jason's head about things aren't always what they they seem and you know then him dying at the hands of the joker not even my my batman father not even my superhero father could could save me you know and go and and going on to become red hood and be self-reliant and never trusting anybody and never letting anybody all the way in um and then you know later in the story when he meets that young uh that young boy whose mother has just od'd on cheer drops he sees himself in that young boy you know couldn't be more clear um and, and he takes it upon himself. Hey, I don't want this kid to end up like I, I ended up, you know, I am going to go find his father. And then to find out his father, he's just one of the main um, bad guys behind these cheer drops. Uh, you know, that's, that's devastating. And even, even still Jason Todd's willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Hey, you know, uh, let me track him down. Let me not just not assume he's, he's, you know, the worst of the worst. And, and tell, you know, has the guy there at, at, at his feet and says, hey, I, I have your son here, your wife OD'd. And, and to have that guy go, oh, I never cared about either one of those. Kid's a brat. You know, wife was an anchor around my neck. I'm glad they're dead. And that he just snaps, you know, and you understand. You understand because it's like cathartically um, or vicariously, either way you want to you want to put it. Jason Todd is, is putting himself in the, 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 the place of that little boy and saying, you know what, this little kid's going to be better off without this dad around. But not only that, Jace, but just to harken back to our earlier review of the Joker. I mean, I think you and I probably think more like Jason Todd because Jason Todd 
Jason Todd's faced evil. And what does he do when he deals with it? He shoots it. He kills it right away. Yeah, he doesn't just like piss it, around. Yeah, that's, just, that's our inclination. That That's why I like Jason Todd is that we are probably more Jason Todd than Batman or Commissioner Gordon than we care to admit. And that's that's why we that's why I think fans are drawn to Jason Todd. And that's what Zardaski gets so well. Yeah, I mean, we saw it in, in Batman Three Jokers where Jason blows the one of the Jokers away. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I have this guy, uh, kids a pain in my ass. Uh, both of them bleeping leeches can go, and yeah, Jason, he's a bang, bang, bang. You're done, you're done, B. Uh, but but does realize that? Oh man, what what have I done now? Now now the kid is is an orphan, you know. So again, very powerful, very poignant. I can't wait to see what happens next. Uh, I, I, Zadarsky. Man, that guy can write some emotionally resonant books. So it's so it's so interesting to me. Uh, I'd love to have him on the the podcast, um, but man, I can never I never get a hold. I see him on plenty of other podcasts, but I, I just don't have any contact info for him. So if anybody listening knows how I can get a hold of Chip Zadarsky to have him on the show, we'd love to have him. So uh, anyway, let's move on to the next story. Uh, I'm gonna go first. This is the Poison Ivy and uh, and Harley Quinn story. I'm gonna go first because I really don't have much to say about it um <laughs> written by stephanie phillips you know she's going to be handling the the poison or the uh the harley quinn regular series going forward um this is clearly fan service for those who believe that joker or joker that harley and, and poison ivy should be in a relationship i have no problem with harley and poison and ivy being in a relationship i think they make a good couple um it's just i don't really care about harley quinn as a character I, I never really have. So I think this is done well. I think that it, it shows th- kind of the relationships and the building blocks for uh, the relationship that they do have. I think both the, the flashback and the, the current timeline are, are colored well. They're colored very differently by Yvonne Placencia. So in that way, it works. I think that the, uh, the visual storytelling from Laura Braga is done very well. Um, uh, and this isn't one of those where we're going to get more of this. This is just a one and done story. We're told at the end to be continued in the pages of Harley Quinn and also in the pages of Batman. We'll get more Harley. We'll get more Poison Ivy. We'll get more of their relationship. I think, again, fans that want them to be together will be happy to read this. Uh, but I'm not the target audience for this, although I read it and I thought, eh, it's fine. It's just just doesn't interest me. Uh, but I know you're a much bigger Harley fan than me, Rocky, so you probably have uh, more more interest in the story than I did. So let's hear it. Well, uh, uh, I think that, I think that this is one of those stories that whose significance will maybe play out more in the future. Historically, this will, this will hearken in a turning point because what makes this very, very clear, this is called Harley Quinn new roots. This is if, if there was any doubt before, because let's be blunt, the whole issue of, is our Harley and Quinn and Poison Ivy a couple? That's been a controversial issue and a, an open question for a while. And DC and Warner Brothers in particular, uh, overall, have they've sort of wavered on it. Are they or aren't they a couple? They kind of are. Well, yes, they are. They definitely are. Then they weren't. Then they broke up in, the, in, their, in their, they had a six issue miniseries where they broke up and now suddenly they're back. Make no mistake. And I'm going to, I'm going to read verbatim the last three omniscient captions of these, of this story. It says, I wish Pam was here. This is Harley Quinn's thoughts. I wish Pam was here. Pam being poison Ivy. And if I need to learn a little patience, she's worth it. Make no mistake, people, Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy are a couple. They may not be officially a couple yet in DC continuity, but they will be. That's what they're moving towards. That's what I love about this. The theme of this story is a comment made by uh, Poison Ivy in the middle of the story where she says, a watched plant never grows, meaning have patience. This is DC Comics telling us readers to have patience. Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy are getting back together. I don't think I'm I don't think I'm stretching things when I when I suggest that that DC Comics in general and the powers that be powers that be at AT&T recognize from the success of the Harley Quinn uh, animated TV series or streaming ser- series that people want Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn together. They're capitalizing on, on that. They even called this 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 story New Roots which is a perfect illusion of plants, 
Poison Ivy, Harley Quinn, New Roots being a new foundation for our relationship. They've asked us in story thematically through to, to have patience. That's what they're working toward. They told us to wait. It's going to be continued in the pages of Harley Quinn and Batman. In other words, this is something that's going to be organically developed. It's not going to be rushed. It's going to be grown. It's going to be harvested. It's going to be organically developed. This is exactly what Harley fans want. Now, I can't speak, obviously, for every fan. But look, Harley and Poison Ivy fans, this is what we want. Look, in every way that DC failed in understanding what we want from Jonathan Kent, they're getting right about Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. And let me sing the praises of writer Stephanie Phillips. This is a new, a relatively new writer that's come across the scene in the last two years. Stephanie Phillips, man, you've done such an amazing job. You've such, you've had such a great year. You did, you did a really good job with Future State. I'm, I'm so impressed with her. I think she's really captured the mood. She's captured the ambiance of these characters. She, she has the language of Harley Quinn down. She understands Harley. She understands Poison Ivy. The relationship, the love and affection between these two characters is obvious. It just bleeds off the page. Uh, kudos to uh, artist Laura Braga. I think this is some of her best work to date. Colors by uh, Yvonne Pl Placencia. So well done. And even a shout out to the letterer. Let's show some love to a letterer once in a while. And World Designs, again, uh, you know, again, <laughs> this is such, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad. I feel privileged again to be able to review this with you, Jace, because I, I really enjoyed this. This, in, th this, whole, this whole comic book was, was really, really good. And again, it's a great time to be a Harley and Poison Ivy fan. We got a lot to look forward to. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to the uh, the next story in the book. It's the the outsider story. Uh, again, written by Brandon Thomas. Max Dunbar handles the uh, line work. Luis Guerrero on colors and Steve Wands on letters. I want to talk about the artist first. Max Dunbar. His art really reminded me of Brett Booth. Maybe not quite as detailed, uh, but in terms of kind of dynamic feel and layouts. I mean, he doesn't do the crazy panel layouts on the page that uh, that Booth is known for either. Um, but just in terms of kind of the way his characters look, um, the action scenes or whatnot. So I, I, I thought the line work was done really, really well. It was a really fast paced story uh, with the outsiders and uh, I enjoyed it. it I mean, it, it, it felt like uh, a, an action movie. Um, you know, was it was there a lot of you know, emotionality to it? And, you know, was there a lot of, of weight to it? No. Uh, it, it was much more kind of like eye candy or that kind of thing. Um, but there's potential there. Um, there, there, there is potential to explore the relationship between these outsiders uh, a little bit more, especially between black lightning and, and metamorpho. They're sort of, uh, working on a way to escape out of, uh, this prison that they've found themselves trapped in. And the whole premise of the story is, uh, Katana being chased by some, uh, some previous enemies of hers and the rest of the outsiders trying to, you know, have her back basically. So uh, this was kind of the shortest story in the book, just a lot of action. We don't know a lot about exactly what's going on yet, but I thought it was entertaining. And I thought the, the high point of it was, uh, was the artwork uh, and the colors that, that really helped bring that kind of dynamic fast paced feel to the story. So uh, what'd you think of this one, Rocky? Uh, I, I thought this was, this was my, uh, my least favorite of the of the entire uh, issue, Batman or of of this Batman Urban Legends number one that we're that we're, we are reviewing. This outsider's story is the least interesting to me, and I thought was the it, it was serviceable. I would call it serviceable, and I would I was disappointed with this. I was disappointed with this because. I recognize the bad guys in this story from being in future state. We never got a lot of inform information about them in future state. And I actually think that the, I actually think that the, that the writer, uh, Brandon Thomas, who I normally love, I, who, who impressed me with future state. I think he assumes, I think he assumes a little bit too much. I think he forgets that this takes place in the present and we're, we're supposed to be introduced to these new villains. I've got no idea what's going on here. Uh, we start off, there we know that black lightning bear in mind that we know from future state that black lightning at some point becomes the living embodiment of lightning and he actually ends up trapped in the sword of zatan of of 
<laughs> he gets up trapped up in the sword that's actually wielded by um uh the signal and so i'm i'm a little bit i don't know what's going on here i know that they it starts off in the present where they're apparently in prison and then it is a flashback to japan where they end up ultimately being chased by the bad guys and then captured and then at the end you know there's a lot of rapport between jefferson black lightning and katana tatsu uh but at the end you know and there's metamorpho here and there's some sort of interaction but there's um this didn't draw me in i i i I, I thought this could have been better myself. I was I was a little bit disappointed. This is this seems to be I don't know. I future state had me sort of excited in terms of I want to know how Black Lightning ends up becoming the living embodiment and lightning trapped in 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 the sword, so to speak. That is uh, that Katana had the sword that usually would trap would have the souls of the people she killed in it. We know from Future State that that Black Lightning ends up being the embodiment of lightning trapped in the sword or, or being part of the sword that is Katana's that ends up being wielded by the signal. This here doesn't really, it seems a little bit more, I guess, I thought I was a little bit confused by it. and Maybe that was just me, but I thought it could be better. But overall, I have enough faith in Brandon Thomas that he'll the story will definitely come through. Max Dunbar on the art was... Um, you know, I thought it was serviceable. I thought it was okay, but overall, this was my least favorite story in the in the in the entire comic. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with you that we don't have any idea what's going on. The other thing about it that um, I, I think I mentioned it when I did the credits uh, initially, but I'll, I'll mention it again. It's worth mentioning. This is part one of three, as opposed to some of the other stories, part one of six, part one of five. So not only do we have no idea what's going on, he only has two more chapters to explain to us what's going on. If they're the same length as this one, I don't know how he possibly <laughs> explains anything. Um, Cause yeah, it's just kind of, here's a yeah. bunch of action. Here's a bunch of bad guys fighting against the outsiders. Um, and uh, black lightning is, is trapped in a, a prison that turns out to be metamorpho himself. Uh, and things are going to happen. <laughs> That's basically what we're, what we're told. So <laughs> how it, how it all plays out. I don't know. I guess we'll wait and see. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the last uh, story in the book. Uh, it's the, uh, the the Grifter story by Matthew Rosenberg uh, with uh, art by Ryan Benjamin, colors by Antonio Fabella Jr., letters by Seda uh, Temafonte. Uh, what, what's your take on uh, on Grifter in Rosenberg's hands? I mean, we saw it. We saw him uh, tell a, a, a two part story in uh, in Future State. Now we're getting more of Rosenberg and Grifter. Uh, I'll be blunt. I want Grifter to have his own series and I want it written by Matthew Rosenberg. I, I laughed. Um, I, I think all of us, those of us who read comic books know exactly what I'm talking about when I say, when I'm about to say the one thing here that we've all experienced from time to time. And it's rare to be able to read a comic book openly and then suddenly burst out laughing and I have to look away from the comic because I'm too busy adjusting my head because I'm, I'm, I'm flipping my head up because I'm laughing in, in humor and I'm so happy and it's, and it's hilarious. There are at least three scenes in this, in, in this story where I'm openly laughing out loud. The, the, the confrontation between, between Grifter and Batman is hilarious. Grifter's sense of humor is hilarious. His confrontation, his his conversations with Lucius Fox are 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 funny. I mean, his, I mean, there's this has th this has humor. This has huge stakes in it. And this is this is this is the grifter. This is following from the events in Future State. We know from Future State that Lucius Fox ultimately ends up working for we know that he worked for lucius fox and we all we know that he ultimately ends up betraying lucius fox in order to save the huntress's life in future state and what this is this this is obviously the present this is the grifter he's 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 being hired by lucius fox to be lucius fox's bodyguard but in the meantime he's supposed to lucius fox is obviously in, has inherited all of bruce wayne's estate so lucius fox is now He's got all these huge, rich assets. So he's got connections all over the world. And Lucius Fox is meeting with the prime minister of some country. It's unimportant which. 
and leave it to Grifter to screw up a perfectly good meeting with the prime minister and ends up actually, you know, actually in, ends up in, in an altercation with the prime minister and uh, thinking he's protecting Lucius Fox. He ends up, you know, dowsing the prime minister in, in, in a swimming pool. Uh, and then he, and then his diplomacy is in the midst of this, dip, you know, this this huge gala with all these diplomats present. And he's he's being his usual sort of ignorant self. Matthew Rosenberg is a master at writing this uh, uh, is is a master at writing characters of the classic sort of do gooder sort of like asshole type superhero and asshole type sort of uh, Batman wannabe uh, heroes vigilante type characters swashbuckling guys that are cut off more than they can chew they're in the middle they're in the middle of a situation that they they can't they don't really know exactly what's going on but they're but they're crazy enough that they always manage to accomplish their task and i gotta say the the rapport here between grifter and even lucius fox i'm i'm so impressed with it the dialogue here is so great master of dialogue even even the altercation here, there, there's a scene here where a where a bouncer, where a bodyguard is is actually is actually checking Grifter to see if he ha has any weapons, <laughs> and he finds like no less than like six different weapons. Uh, and Grifter's sitting there. Oh, I forgot I had that gun, or or that's just for show. Uh, you count that, and it's a little pocket knife. Uh, that was a gift. Uh, whoops! And they actually find a grenade on him, and and the bouncer finally asks, "Is there any more?" And he goes, "I don't know. You want to keep looking?" <laughs> I mean, he's, this is such a fun comic and Grifter is just such a, he's such a breath of fresh air. And, you know, it's funny because Grifter is now part of the Batman universe, but it, it occurred to me reading this, that nobody in the Batman family actually has a sense of humor as good as the Grifter. We, we need the Grifter in the Batman universe, man. He's funny. He, he's got, he's got a, he's got a, there's something about him. He just brings a sense of joy and levity and just plain craziness and just fun adventure and irresponsibility to the Batman life. Cause everybody in the bat, everybody in the Batman universe is so goddamn serious all the time. Grifter is a breath of fresh air. And thank you to Matthew Rosenberg for reminding us what the Batman universe is missing. And I'm not saying that the Grifter is necessarily Batman, but He's clearly being written into the Batman universe here. And I think the Batman universe is going to benefit from it because I thoroughly enjoyed this. This was a joy to behold. And let me just say this, that the grifter ends up being blamed for the death of Nora Freeze, who is Mr. Freeze's wife. And so that's going to have huge implications moving forward because we all know how obsessed uh, Mr. Freeze is with his wife to know that she is now we already know she was resurrected in the pages of detective comics now that she is dead actually dead you know that there's a confrontation between Grifter and Mr. Freeze that's going to be coming up and I am so looking forward to that and when you throw in Grifter's sense of humor man we are in for a ride my friends this is a must read and I'm again I'm so impressed that I'm, I'm I'm happy I'm happier than a pig and shit right now yeah, this story was was fantastic, and 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 here's the thing, right? Like, Rocky barely mentioned a couple of the things that actually happen in the issue in terms of. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, no. That that's that's my point. Like, you know, yes, uh, you know, we get a the, the whole grifter is going to be blamed for the the death of Nora Freeze. There's so much. There's so many more little seeds that are planted in terms of what's going to happen in the narrative. Uh, so many little things that that are planted with. What Grift, he spills a cup of coffee on a on a security guard so he can <laughs> yeah. steal his badge and sneak in someplace where he's not going to go. It's it's so yeah. clear that he is so competent, but uh, he does have that self of humor that that sense of uh, self deprecation, that sense of humor, um, and doesn't take himself too seriously. And and I'll get to that in a second. But the fact that we can talk about this issue and we can talk about Grifter and and kind of the overall. Uh, tone that Matthew Rosenberg is Matthew Rosenberg is bringing to this character, and talk about how much we enjoy it without even talking about and that much of the plot because it's 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 <laughs> exactly. the plot is almost the plot is almost secondary to how much you enjoy the craziness and the antics and the hijinks of of the grifter. So he's always been an asshole. He's always had somewhat of a sense of humor, but it was much more of a kind of a dry wit. 
Um, and, and we, we kind of were laughing at the people that Grifter was making fun of or t- tearing down with his one-liners, uh, kind of like the humor in an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, you know, stick around uh, or, or whatever, you know. Uh, but this is a much more self-aware version of Cole Cash. He's aware that he's an asshole. He's aware that he's um, <laughs> kind of a screw up at times. Um, and so it's, it's with that sort of feeling where now we're not just, you know, laughing at who grifters laughing at or who he's making fun of uh we're laughing at 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 grifter himself and grifters laughing along with us because he doesn't take himself too seriously to rocky's point about all the bat characters taking everything in life including themselves so seriously so that's what rosenberg is bringing to the character that i think i haven't not that i've read every grifter comic ever but he's doing it better than anybody i've ever seen and and i think that that sense of self-deprecation uh is to a greater level than than anything i've ever read of grifter so that's fantastic and and the fact that i'm excited just for that um and then all of a sudden the the story is is secondary to that but the story that that uh rosenberg is is telling about corporate espionage and you know double dealing and these criminals you know all out for themselves that's interesting uh, in and of itself and i think um we're going to when after we've read the whole story, we'll go back and probably, you know, read it as a, uh, you know, in one sitting as one whole long narrative. And we'll get even more out of this issue of little Easter eggs or plot points that we got the, the very seeds of starting in this uh, first issue. So, yeah, it, it's masterfully done. The art is absolutely spectacular. Uh, my favorite moment is probably once Grifter gets into the, the, the gala that, that Rocky mentioned earlier and he's talking to Lucius Fox and apologizing for dumping the, the prime minister into the pool and saying Grifter's like, yeah, just take it out of my check, whatever I cost you on the deal. And uh, <laughs> Lucius Fox is like, oh, the $1.3 billion deal? And Grifter's like, wait, what? Spits out his drink, yeah, <laughs> spits out the champagne on somebody's back, on the back of this woman. She's wearing a backless dress. He yeah. spits the champagne out. Yeah, and then I like when he suggests you, you can garn- you, you can take it off my check at $100 a month. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he's like, "What for the next thousand years?" <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic, you know. Uh, Lucius Fox is definitely playing the straight man to Grifter's uh, shenanigans, and it's uh, and it's really really oh, fun. Yeah, in fact, what Lucius Fox says is, "Oh, for the next thirteenth million weeks, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna take a hundred dollars out of your check." So yeah, th- it, this is fantastic. Uh, I agree with Rocky hundred percent. Give me an ongoing uh, monthly book with Grifter and Matthew Rosenberg. Um, and I'm in, uh, I'm in every week. Uh, this is exactly, uh, what the, the bat family needs. Somebody a little irreverent, somebody who doesn't take themselves too seriously. Um, and, uh, the scenes, uh, with, with Grifter and Batman are, are fun too. Um, where Grifter and, and Batman, uh, kind of get into a little fisticuffs. That's, uh, that's fun as well. So uh, there is a little bit of, we didn't mention it. There's a little bit in, in the, in the first couple pages of, of team seven. So fans of wildcats are going to, um, and team seven, you, you know, you're going to get a little, a little bit of a chance to see uh, some of the, some of the history of the team and, and whatnot. And uh, again, I think giving Rath, Matthew Rosenberg, his own story to tell his own, his own title to tell uh, a grifter story would give, more of a chance to, to do those kind of flashbacks and to give uh, Wildstorm fans and Team 7 fans and Wildcat fans a little more of, uh, of Grifter's backstory. There's so much there to, to learn. So, yeah, I think the whole creative team, Matthew Rosenberg, the art by, by Ryan Benjamin, colors by Antonio Fabella, who we were big fans of. All of it works really, really well. This is a really, really amazing comic. Um, and it was tough for me. I, 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 I can't really choose between the Zadarsky red hood story and the grifter rosenberg story for me they're both like nine out of ten i mean they are up there um and i this is the other thing about this this batman urban legends anthology uh you know and rocky alluded to it earlier when we first started talking about it was the fact that god there's just so much batman now you know too, some people would say too much uh but batman's the engine that drives dc it's the, he's the one that pays the bills and keeps the lights on so it's perfectly understandable but so many of the books that are coming out now with Batman in it, we've talked about, have that that cynical feel. You know, they're fascist um, villains or fascist organizations that Batman's fighting against, and this and that. And it doesn't, you know, it's not resonating with me. I'm reading it, but I'm not excited to read it necessarily. This anthology 
brings back the feel of Batman that I like, the feel of Batman that I remember from the late 80s and early 90s, where everything isn't dark and gritty all the time, where it can be fun and it can be interesting. And uh, more so than any Bat book I've read in recent memory, uh, this anthology kind of gives that classic Batman feel. Uh, last time I felt like this, this classic timeless Batman feel was when I read the first story arc in Detective that Peter J. Tomasi and Brad Walker did, where it's sort of a timeless story of Batman that could fit in in any particular era. Uh, that's what I, the feeling I got when I read this anthology. So yeah, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And uh, I love, I mean, I've never been that big of a Grifter fan or a Red Hood fan for that matter. And these stories were both absolutely amazing. Uh, I loved it. So uh, yeah. any last, any last thoughts on this issue, Rock? Uh, yeah, just just the, the fact that the highest compliment that I can give this Batman Urban Legends, this Batman Urban Legends compilation, this comic book, is that uh, with the exception of the Outsiders story, which I thought was largely forgettable, uh, is that the other stories could be their own individual comic books that I would have actually purchased and I think are worth more than a lot of the comic books currently on the stands. And so just even if I exclude the Outsiders comic, this is a comic book worth getting despite its price tag. This is, this has a big, pretty big price tag. Batman urban legends. I think, uh, can you help me out? I, what is it? What is it? A six ninety nine? Yeah, price tag? I think, I think it is six ninety nine. Yeah. I think it's, so. But it's worth it. it. It is actually worth it. And my only downside is that it's frustrating to me. And this is not something I don't have a, I don't have a solution to it, but it's an ongoing problem is that if, Quite frankly, if if we have to sneak in a fantastic grifter storyline to into a Batman Urban Legends comic book, so people take notice of uh, grifter and Matthew Rosenberg's talents, so be it. And Chip Sardaski's talents, so be it. I mean, I, I'm just saying, I, I'm I'm impressed. And and again, Stephanie Phillips, kudos to you as well. And even Brandon Peterson, which is a great up and coming writer, I think uh, he, what he has to work. Pardon me, Brandon Thomas, Brandon Thomas. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. Brandon Thomas. Uh, kudos to all of you. I think this was probably one of the certainly one of the best comic books of the week and I highly recommend it. Despite the price tag, guys, it's worth the money. Pick up Batman Urban Legends number one. Yep, I agree. Uh, in addition to the books that we talked about, uh, Sweet Tooth, The Return, number five is also out this week from D.C., as well as American Vampire 1976, number six, uh, number six of eight for that um the final chapter of uh, Scott Snyder and Raphael Albuquerque's American Vampire uh, Universe at DC. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode. I'll remind you guys uh, once again that there is a, a another issue or another episode rather of uh, of the Comic Source coming out today. Uh, that's audio only, uh, talking about some more DC books: Shazam number four, Freedom Fighters number four, Justice League number twenty one. Hawkman number 11. Don't forget that Rocky recently joined us uh, as well for the uh, the Bad Idea Takeover to talk about any act number one. There's a book that is definitely worth your time. And uh, even if you didn't get a first print, not first print is open order to, at any Bad Idea retailer. You can get it for cover price. So please don't go out on eBay and spend more than cover price on that book because uh, just tell your retailer, order, order your, the current printing for you and they have to sell it to you for, for cover price. And a reminder that Dinesh and Warren will be on to talk more about idea uh, this coming Sunday. So uh, anything you want to plug that you have coming up, Rocky? Uh, well, no, I'm uh, I actually, well, I'll be, uh, I do do the YouTube version of this podcast in conjunction with you. So if people, uh, for those people, I, I absolutely encourage, uh, Jace, I know that you have a, you have a fantastic podcast. You do a great job. I, I encourage people to go to Comic Source. Uh, Jace, I mean, Jace, you're a workaholic, my friend. I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but I, I got to tell you guys listening, Jace does an amazing job between his interviews. He doesn't just do comic book reviews with me, but with a whole slew of other people and professionals and creators in the industry. Uh, and, you know, it's great. There, there's so much subscribe to him when if you can on on the podcast on on any any place that does podcasts you can get a hold of comic source do it it's well worth your time uh you don't have to listen to everything because you have a lot a wide range of options i i will be doing the youtube version of, the, of this podcast in conjunction with uh with uh comic source that's on my channel at uh comic boom uh exclamation mark on youtube 
You can follow me on Twitter at Metropolis40. And Jace, once again, thanks to you. Thank you for having me, my friend. Yeah, and I'll also uh, let me plug something for you then, Rock. Uh, so recently, Rocky did this awesome uh, uh, version of uh, kind of, hey, look what I found in my collection um, on his channel. Uh, and, and again, go to YouTube, look for Comic Boom with an exclamation point and subscribe. And uh, if you're not familiar with him, start with that episode, man. That one, that one was so fun. So I, you you went to your storage unit and just pulled out a, a box of comics that had been stored there for a while. Is that what went down and, well, and just went through and started, hey, look, this is worth <laughs> money now. That's worth money now. I was jealous. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I do. I, um, at the risk of sounding, I, I think I'm a lot. I really do feel like uh, I think Jason, and I, I think you, you, you and I are both kindred spirits that we, 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 we love the industry so much. We, we love reviewing comic books and talking about other creators and what they do. But as, as, as comic collectors, we, we actually do have, I, I think we, we have a lot in our own personal collections. And, it, yep. and the truth is I have, I have quite a nice personal collection and I have, and I've just, but I, I'm not a speculator per se. In other words, I, I do have another, I'll, I have a secret identity. It's not really secret, but I do actually have a job where I pay my mortgage through. And <laughs> so I don't make my money buying and selling comic books, but I do own a lot of comic books <laughs> and a lot of them are key collectors. And, and now lately over the last few years, because of the pandemic, I have been astonished to realize just how many people really seem to want to buy. And I'll be lying if I said I wasn't contemplating selling a large part of my collection just because I, I think, frankly, with all due respect to speculators, the money is better spent in, a, in an investment than in, in the comic book itself. But that's a, that's a topic for another day. But uh, maybe one day you and I will talk about comic book speculation and, 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 our, and our own personal collections. But yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I'm, I, got up, I got a whole bunch of slew of boxes that I'll be doing random videos on on comics i have in my collection i just generally find them to be boring uh conversation but there's so many youtube videos that get so many views on people seem to be interested in people just showing their comic books yeah. on a video screen it's like oh okay if you really want to know <laughs> this is what i own okay yeah. there you go <laughs> yeah I guess that would it is be, what it is yeah that would be a great topic so everybody either uh on the youtube channel uh, on rocky's channel leave co uh, comment below let us know if you want us to, to do a, a special spotlight on speculation or uh, hit me up on twitter at at the comic source or instagram or email or, or any of that stuff just do a search for the comic source you'll find me reach out through social media let us know if you'd be interested in us doing a, a, a kind of a spotlight on on speculating so uh anyway i think we've rambled on long enough uh, i echo rocky sentiments this was a great week for dc gives me hope that uh you know it's not going to be all bad going forward uh, and, and we didn't necessarily think it would be uh, but it's nice to see them uh, actually proving it right so uh, again thanks for listening everybody be sure you go to comic boob exclamation point on youtube and subscribe or look for the comic source on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us there so once again we want to thank everybody for listening and we'll talk to you next time Bye.